our next speaker for, uh, for this workshop is uh, Simon Angus. So Simon joined the Department of Economics at Monash University as a lecturer in 2008 after working for two years as a lecturer in the School of Economics, Uni of New South Wales. And in 2011, he was made a senior lecturer at Monash. Uh, his, uh, uh, his PhD dissertation entitled Economic Networks, Communication, Cooperation and Complexity extended a game theoretic analysis of network formulation and agent behaviour on dynamic ad hoc networks. He has a keen interest in the science of complexity arising from his diverse background across science and engineering which so far has resulted in research projects spanning self-organising polymer films, systems biology, models of cancer, a novel open-ended evolutionary approach to technology networks. His recent and current projects mostly consider technology and inventions using methods from across the sciences. In 2004, he was selected as one of 10 doctoral students to attend the Santa Fe Institute graduate workshop on computational, uh, social sciences and complexity, and um, a month-long um, uh, workshop on complex systems in, seminar, uh, in summer school. He has a strong in, uh, interest in the scholarly approach to best practice teaching and learning, and uh, he's now at the University of New South Wales School of Business Faculty of Teaching and Learning Award for in, in, uh, Innovations in Teaching and Learning. So I'll hand over to Sam. Uh, thanks, Kerry. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I, uh, I would have probably adapted my bio uh, to give you a more current uh, situation, but that's okay. Uh, now you know a bit more about my history. It's eclectic and so on. Uh, as Kerry said, probably the most important thing is around the uh, science of innovation and technology. And I should say that this talk probably sits neatly after the first two. Uh, both Rob, who's uh, down the hall from me at Monash, uh, and uh, Steve's talk from Google, uh, Elements of those you'll see come into what uh, we're trying to do here, um, and I'll pick that up as we go along. I should mention uh, the small group that we have working on this project, Klaus Ackerman, my PhD student, and Paul Raschke, uh, my colleague in the Department of Economics at Monash. Uh, these are both uh, terrific guys to work with, uh, and uh, they just tend to, it turns out they both hail from Austria, uh, and so a lot of our early uh, working out was done either between uh, looking at what happened in Melbourne or uh, in different Austrian cities where these two knew exactly what was happening. Uh, and so on. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get into what, uh, what I want to talk about here. So uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a background about the internet um, because the research here involves all of the internet. Uh, that's what I mean by the fire hydrant. Um, it's going to be the whole internet space and uh, there's a Hilbert projection there which I'll explain in a moment. But I want to give you an idea of the data I'm dealing with. Um, this is uh, a quite large data set uh, and uh, I think fits the bill for both Steve's definition of multiple computers needed to work with it, but also probably any definition uh, working one of big at the moment. And uh, it, I want to give you an understanding of where the data arises from, because that's really the novelty here is this interesting data set that we think reveals something uh, potentially very interesting about human behaviour uh, worldwide over a key period in the internet's expansion. I'm interested in the internet because, as was said, I'm interested in technology and ideas. In economics, there's various ways to think about prosperity and human development. Um, some people like to think about uh, resource extraction or uh, capital. Some people like to think about labour and training and education and human capital accumulation. Uh, what has been underdone, in my opinion, in economics is largely a study of technology and the way technology actually works, uh, how to model it over time. And so I have a number of projects to look at technology, uh, both in kind of early man, both in the Industrial Revolution, and also this, which is probably the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, the techniques that we use mostly involve computers. Uh, sometimes it's heavy data analysis and distributed work, like here. Sometimes it's modelling uh, using economic theory and then numerical simulation. Uh, so I want to give you a feel for this particular data set and how we actually get our measurements, so just to understand it that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the data itself, and uh, then one of the key points of the talk is really to talk about the processing and how we bring the different data sets together, which was quite a challenge. And I'll give you a, a bit of a flavour for some of the measurements we've been able to do so far on the data set. Uh, the work is somewhat preliminary uh, in the sense that we're in the more exploratory phase of the data itself, 
Uh, and I'll talk in context of Rob and Steve's talk as well about uh, the way that we're currently looking at the data and where we're hoping to take it. So uh, for those of you who uh, know this already, I apologise, but hopefully uh, for many of you will find this interesting. Uh, we all use the internet. I'm going to take that as an assumption, as a given. Um, and when you use the internet, uh, generally if you're not at a location like this, but you're at home, uh, which is where I'm going to be speaking mostly personal internet use, you get assigned uh, an address in the internet so that your traffic, your packets information know uh, where they're coming from and where they're going to. And when you're at an institution like this, generally the institution will have an IP, an internet protocol location, which is the, uh, at least in IPv4, which is the internet protocol version 4 of the addressing system for the internet, which is being superseded by IPv6, because IPv4, due to the way that it's arranged, so you've got uh, up to 256 locations or numbers that can be put into four different locations in your uh, IP location, you end up with only getting, only, I should say, getting uh, about four billion locations, unique locations. Uh, where we've run out of that already, actually. Uh, and so there are various techniques being done at the moment to handle the fact that we've got uh, location problems, but IVV6 should solve it by greatly expanding the locations. Um, you can, uh, so when, you get, uh, when you're at an institution like this, generally there'll be a forward-facing internet location, uh, which generally speaking will route all of the traffic internally, and there'll be a big pipe, if you like. Uh, when you talk about the internet, sometimes plumbing is a good metaphor. Uh, you have a massive pipe at the front end of the organisation, and then you have a whole lot of kind of coming to the house, and then within the house there's lots of rooms, and you've got piping going from the big pipe to all the different rooms, and generally they get one forward-facing uh, kind of pipe number going into the home. That's not always true, but uh, mostly that's true in uh, some of the, most of the major firms and organisations. So you sort of sit behind one IP. That's going to be significant for thinking about this data in, in a moment. Uh, if you want to think about the internet and kind of map it, how do you deal with such a massive set of locations? You don't, uh, at this stage, use Google Maps, although <laughs> eventually they might come up with a, an awesome projection of this linking with geospatial. Uh, maybe that's an idea for the future. Uh, there is a spatial component, which I'll mention. Uh, you can get what's called a Hilbert projection, which is a neat way of showing this enormous number of locations in one diagram. Um, if you notice in the Hilbert projection, there's some areas where uh, this is the intensity of the colour here is actually the intensity of use, and this is from 2012, uh, data collected uh, illegally, not by us, but by uh, an anonymous uh, internet actor called Karna Botnet, who uh, managed to set up some, uh, what we would probably call uh, malicious, or it's not malicious, but uh, a bot which was distributed to 150,000 computers which uh, he or she co-opted uh, over a year without the users knowing it um, and managed to have a series of mothership organisations and so on amongst the different computers to allocate the IPv space to scan and send out little pieces of little signals to say, are you on? Are you off? Are you online? Tell me what you're doing to all these different locations. And so it was a big, what they called, internet census, um, a scan of the entire internet in uh, 2012 using different protocols to try and see if those different locations were on or offline. Uh, what you will notice is that some of the locations give no response. Some of them are allocated to, for example, Department of Defence or military and so on. Uh, some of them are unused in areas and so on, and that plays into the way the IPv4 space is kind of cut up. Uh, so, so the information we're generally looking at here is not those to do with uh, places which are either unused or kind of... Uh, uh, allocated specifically to, say, defence or so on, where uh, we're not going to get a whole lot of information back. Uh, if you want to try and find your own IP, just to give you a feel for the scale of this projection, um, if you look up the top left, that's the map I've shown you so far, the second one is uh, I'm zooming in, and then the third one I'm zooming in uh, again, and there's a little red dot there, which was the IP I was working on at the time uh, in the Hilbert projection. If you go back and try and locate that back in the other one, it, gives you some sense of the scale of what we're working with here when we talk about the IP uh, space. Uh, over time, you can uh, actually collect data. Uh, the data we have would enable you to run a Hilbert projection over time, and you could see the kind of filling in of the IPv4 space as IP addresses are allocated uh, to users. Uh, the period of analysis we're looking at is uh, we... Uh, I'll mention again the uh, Karna botnet data in a moment, but uh, we have a data set uh, from USC, as it turns out, 
um, which covers the IPv4 space, so a scan of all of those sort of available locations over the years 2000, it's actually towards the end of 2004, but 2005 to 2012. Uh, I mention that because it's a pretty interesting time in the internet's expansion. It's a time when uh, the internet uh, kind of penetration, if you like, so the, the, the number of people on the internet, so there's a use, this is the user side, uh, grew from approximately uh, somewhere in the order of 14% of the global population to somewhere in the order of 36% of the population. So it's a pretty uh, interesting time because it's a rapid period of uh, penetration increase, and once you get up to sort of 35%, you're starting to get pretty good coverage of most countries, cities, and so on in the world. Now, this is uh, what we originally saw on the internet. So this is data from the Kana botnet um, internet census. And what the author here has done is put down the uh, internet users who are online at a given geospatial location uh, at a point in time. And just pausing on that for a moment, uh, as you might expect, those people have looked at data uh, on a global scale before. It follows fairly closely uh, to, uh, in one sense, population, but uh, obviously there's some problems. For example, Africa uh, is almost completely dark, uh, so obviously there's a prosperity uh, overlay going on as well. Uh, this is not unusual when you see light data uh, from satellites. My colleague Paul actually happens to be a bit of an expert with light data, so we look to combine the two in the future, that is uh, from at night, if you take pictures of uh, the Earth's uh, surface, uh, then you get uh, the lights that are on. In large cities, you get um, kind of a thresholding effect where the kind of the white can't get any more white, and so you don't get uh, terrific information, but below the very larger cities, you actually start to get some of the best information about uh, trying to get infer the level of prosperity of places where the data collection isn't very good, or the data collection uh, is uh, uh, not reported accurately for political reasons, let me put it that way. Uh, that's going to feature as well in our data. Uh, could I, Tony, if I can have the GIF? Thank you. Now, what Karna Botnet did was uh, they put together a 24-hour sequence of the internet, uh, internet's activity. This is one of the diagrams that I think was most persuasive for me to think there's something in here, as an economist, as a behavioural scientist, as a complex systems guy, I thought this is pretty interesting data. Because what you see is that as the night-day works across the globe, yes, there are some areas that we might call always online, but there are a lot of areas, and at least even in those, you get intensity changes. So what you're actually getting is a 24-hour information globally on people's interaction with a transformative technology called the internet. And this intensity variation, we think, probably reveals interesting behavioural information about those users, which previously, either for reasons that people don't want to divulge it, or because it's just too expensive to get the information uh, you don't have access to. This got us thinking of the various social science research questions we could ask of such a data set. And that really started us off thinking, well, how would we kind of handle this sort of data not just on one day's 24-hour cycle, although this is uh, aggregated off over 2012, but what if we could get over time as well, and what if we could start analysing it down to units of observation like cities or regions and so on? Because uh, you, as, as you notice here, this is just not one light for Australia. Uh, there isn't a dot in the middle of, say, Australia near Ayers Rock, which shows Australia's internet usage over time. People kind of get that data in different forms. This is data down to very interestingly small granular locations. In fact, actually, there's probably a good deal of error in some of these observations because the data set being used for the locations is uh, from a lower quality data set than we'll be using. Anyway, so that started us off thinking. Uh, if I can go back, thanks, Tony, beauty. So what do we seem to be having here? What's the, op what's the opportunity? The opportunity is, firstly, a comprehensive data set on human behaviour. Uh, it's global, simultaneous measurement of human behaviour engaging with a pretty transformative technology. I put a little asterisk there to remind me that, um, just coming back to a theme I mentioned before, what's fascinating about the internet is that if you have users who are online in any country, it's actually very hard to stop someone coming from a completely remote location and finding out what's going on in your country. It's all connected. That's, that's the point. And so 
with this technology, we can actually, if you're connected to the internet somewhere, you can send a little piece of information, a signal out to an IP who's miles and miles and miles away from you, possibly in a completely closed country, and you can see what the response is back again. That's a pretty interesting survey option. There's not a lot of places where you can do that. You don't have to, your packet doesn't have to carry a visa uh, across borders and so on and come back again. Uh, it just can do that by itself because that's the point of the internet. Uh, so there's some pretty interesting possibilities with this sort of data. Uh, it's not just surveying cities. Obviously, we can get behavioural information about uh, individual users by doing surveys and so on, and we've seen some useful information from uh, Australian tourism that uh, Rob put up before. Uh, but here, we can actually, if you like, survey, but uh, across the whole world uh, in a very comprehensive way. The second thing which is important to social scientists uh, to point out is uh, whilst surveys can be informative, and we see that, um, for certain questions, uh, economists don't trust what people talk about or say they're going to do. We prefer to look at what they do. So we like revealed preferences, so how they actually behave to know what this person actually does value or do with their time rather than what they would like you to think they value or do with their time. In this case, we've got internet activity data, which is actually what they did with their, with their IP, whether it was online or offline and so on, rather than them telling me how much internet they use and so on. So it's revealed versus stated. We get the revealed information here, which is important to us. Uh, thirdly, it's granular, which I've mentioned before. The observations we're going to be getting from this data set is whether or not an IP was online uh, at a given second of a given day in a given year uh, at a given location down to about 10 to 30 kilometres kind of inaccuracy. That's, 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 again, pretty remarkable. We're going to be aggregating that up into 15-minute chunks, hence the title of the talk. Uh, but that's wonderful data to use. Uh, accuracy I've mentioned and the data range I've mentioned. So from a social science perspective, we want to ask questions, a lot of questions about this data set. And there'll be other social scientists I know who'll be interested in it. So one of the big challenges, actually, is to get this data set into a form that other social scientists can use. So one of the collaborators in this work, along with Massive, uh, which is the Synch Australian Synchrotron's uh, cluster or distributed computing uh, architecture, is OUDA, which is the Australian uh, Domain Registry Organisation, who have uh, sponsored uh, this project. And uh, we're hoping to produce some uh, reports for them on Australian LGA internet use, which other social scientists can get access to and use. So we see, like, what are the main behavioural patterns of humankind? So not just of a city or a location, but, but humankind. What are the categorisations of our human behaviour? Um, how has the diffusion of the internet affected democratic uh, outcomes? Uh, because we can collect ballot box information at a quite uh, granular spatial locations and then connect it up. Uh, can internet activity reveal economic time allocation and so on and so forth? In terms of other people who have worked on this sort of data, there's a growth in... Uh, this strand of data which is connected to mobile phone use. So what typically happens in papers that are pretty impacting at the moment is a, is a group or a research group will buddy up with a mobile phone data company. Usually they get data on uh, one to three or four cities and they do some fascinating data analysis on that. Uh, at the moment, most of these are coming out of Spain and so you get information on Barcelona and other uh, Spanish cities. And uh, you get not only in one, so in the second one I referenced there, Tool et al, um, they actually couple the mobile phone use to the distance between the users in the call. So it's location and time, which is really fascinating. Uh, I'm going to come back to uh, this uh, time use because it reveals what we think is probably confirmed something we think about our data. This is from Nature showing uh, kind of a... A, a paper, a, an issues paper, which talks about the way that uh, telecommunications data uh, can strongly correlate. It's a little hard to see because their white of their telecommunications activity is uh, obscuring, obscuring the very light blue colours of London and other places for the economic activity, but surely they're very highly connected. Uh, so there's a lot of interest at the moment in getting access to these novel data sets, which is like from phone logs, internet logs and so on. So let me tell you a little bit more about this data particularly. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, give some information about it. So we, we have observations, as I said, which is a time, uh, an IP, so in a location, and what's called an ICMP 
response. Uh, that just is one of the signaling protocols uh, in the internet. It's a very simple, basic one. It just says, are you on or are you off? And you get a piece of information back again from the IP, and we can infer from that whether they're online, offline, or unused. If I was to aggregate those by seconds kind of observations and put them into 15 minutes, then across a day I might have a 15 minute trace that looks like this where white is kind of offline and grey might be online and these could be the various sets of IPs that I'm scanning through at the time. Obviously this list is very long uh, but I'm just giving you a sample. You'll get things like, well, some of them were never online so there was never a time when a scan went out and we got an online back again. Some of them will be always online. Okay, because there's some sort of forward-facing firm or server which is always online. Uh, Google is always online. Uh, that's helpful for all of us. Uh, some of us using our personal devices actually go offline during the day, even if you think that your computer is not necessarily turned off. For example, most modems at the moment, after about 15 minutes, because of resource constraints in the router, they'll actually turn off or uh, come back as unused uh, for after a 15-minute inactivity period and then you'll come back online again. Uh, once you start searching for a website, immediately the router will pick that up and get you back online, and you'll be online for a period of time again. Uh, so these are the kind of things we learn from it, and there'll be uh, different variations of people's online, offline behaviour. Some of them are not routed, and we can learn of that as well. Uh, and if I go forward a day, this is all just hypothetical, uh, fictional data, by the way, I should stress. Uh, none of these IPs I'm actually re representing here the real IP usage on this particular date, but suppose. Um, between the days, you'll get different patterns occurring. Some will become online, some will be offline, and so on. That's the kind of data we're looking at, okay? So we're going to have, for an IP, we've got uh, different times through the day, we've got whether they're online or offline. What we do is we're going to now link this to another data set, uh, which is a commercial data set, which is used for marketing usually, which locates a IP to a location uh, on the globe at a latitude and longitude with pretty high accuracy. This is where the kind of 10 to 20 kilometre radius comes in. And uh, there are various versions of data sets like this around. There's some free and some not free-ish ones. Uh, this is an expensive one, uh, which has high accuracy and the best we think is around at the time. What they do is they locate all the IPs and they give uh, a revisions of this data set. So what we, the challenge that we have is to try and connect up a given IP on a given date with the correct revision of the uh, IP location data set to give us information about where this IP was when it was online or offline. Because the IPs are sold to uh, your internet provider, uh, they can, then if they're getting used, they're active, they get put into a routing, they're on through the, they're routed, uh, and then uh, they're, uh, they potentially might, their location might change because the internet provider from time to time may not use that section of the IP locations anymore, or uh, because they might still own them, but that IP has moved in their kind of selling uh, from one location to another, or they're dynamically routed, in which case your IP might switch from day to day, in which case, or not necessarily day to day, but on some time frame, in which case, again, your location for that IP might switch. So there's various reasons why we need to accurately go to the correct revision of the location database to find out where this IP was at any time. Uh, this looks simple. On this slide, I, you know, take my IP, go across here, grab the correct revision and locate it on the planet and off I go and create an IP location database. Uh, this, <laughs> friends, is not simple. Um, we, and drawing on what Steve was talking about before, um, basically his assumption that we're in a MapReduce world or Hadoop, yes, we, that is us. Um, in fact, we can't use that, um, not for the latency issues that Steve was talking about, because um, actually we don't have anywhere on the planet, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> Steve might say, well, actually at Google we have, well, I'm pretty sure we don't have anything on the planet that can deal with this kind of uh, mapping or first joining phase of what we would need to do. If we just took, for example, the 2010 data, we have around 260 billion, uh, sorry, trillion, billion observations from USC and that's just the filtered ones, the, th the ones that we're sort of interested in. So these are the IP measurements, observations for IPs that are online or offline. We want to connect these to what's called Digital Envoy, which is the location records, of which there's 4.3 uh, billion. If we were to do in the normal process of MapReduce or Hadoop, which is the map for or the join phase, 
Generally what happens is you first create a cross product of those two and then you filter, you reduce and you get out the information you want. If we were to do that, uh, you end up with uh, a very, very large uh, data set. It's not something that any computer can handle. So we need to find an alternative. And that's, by the way, just 2010, right? We have 11, 12, and it's getting bigger because the observations are larger as more people are online. So the way we deal with it is actually similar to the shards approach or the partitioning approach. And with the access that we have to the synchrotron, which has over 200 nodes, uh, we can get access to basically all of them at once. Each of those nodes has uh, multiple uh, processes, so usually they're 12 CPU uh, virtual nodes. And they've got a distributed file system, HDF5, which allows us to very nicely uh, organise all the files uh, concurrently across the different locations. And the first step we have to do, therefore, which is a bit of a similar approach, is we partition the uh, location data set uh, into using a modified quantile algorithm, which basically just takes whatever size, resultant size we want of these uh, kind of uh, the partitioning of the locations, we have to choose the quantile, but we can end up getting manageable partition sizes, which we can do a first check, kind of like indexing the, partition, uh, indexing the location database, and then we can start doing our uh, Hadoop activity on them. So it's bringing down the scale of the data to something that's actually manageable using this first uh, partitioning step. And it's really possible because of the uh, distributed file system. This is not something you want to be doing in the cloud. This has got very strong, very nice uh, hardware, which has got excellent communication within the cluster. Uh, so if you're not a massive user or you don't have an account there or there's something similar, really, the first question most people ask about clusters is, oh, you know, how many CPUs per node? And then they might ask how many nodes. The real question you want to ask is about uh, the communication between them, uh, because that's really where the power comes once you start scaling up into this massive data. So that's, I guess, for those in the game, that's the kind of way we solve this problem. Uh, and I should say we, Klaus, has worked very hard on this, and uh, we've uh, only in the last kind of two or so months been able to start working on the resultant data sets. OK, so what does it look like? What does it look like? Well, let me train our attention on London. Uh, I'll tell you in a moment how we locate London, but let's look at London for a moment. Basically, if we get the fraction uh, online, which is the count of people or uh, count of IPs online at this location, divided by those counted to be online plus the count of those offline, then the raw kind of data starts to look like this. The colouring here is by day, so a different colour for each day. And you can see that the raw data is kind of messy, it's disjointed, there's places where we don't get observations and so on. We're at the mercy here of the people doing the scans. The USC data set is legal, by the way, not the illegal data set. If I zoom in at any of these, actually what's good is that we start to see there are some similarities. Even areas which look sort of messy and have dropouts, there's this persistent periodicity to the data. Uh, it's a little hard to see the periodicity here, but you can see it coming through. That's nice. And what if we can sort of stretch and normalise each of these days and start to get a daily trend for a location at a year or across years? Uh, because that's probably that kind of behavioural intra-daily online offline trace is probably what we want to get at to give us some information about this location. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, drop out what's always online. Because remember, below these little marginal changes in the online activity is a whole lot of servers and things that are always online. We don't learn much from the always online thing, so it's always online. What we want to get is at the margin how people, are, how people are using their internet. And hopefully there's enough users that are displaying the information about that location's culture, behaviour, preferences and so on. So, how do we do that? Um, first step, if I look at the raw overlaying of by day, uh, it, you get 96, 15 minute uh, segments in one day, so that's why the graph here goes up to 100, there's 96 segments. These are all the traces, if I just look kind of down the line, I drop out everything that's always online, I normalise these traces between 0 and 1, I get this kind of very pretty, uh, easy to read information about what's going on in London across time. Obviously it's very messy. And these are the smooth data, by the way, so I've used robust smoothing to take care of, you know, missing observations and so on through the day. The first step in this process at the moment is really we're going to lose a lot of uh, data mining techniques to get a, a view of the data. The first step is to do some, uh, so we cut by 24 hour periods and then I'm going to do some, uh, as I said, some smoothing and then I'm going to do some wavelet decomposition. And based on the wavelet decomposition, uh, using multi-signal 1D, if you're familiar with wavelets, 
uh, to get a view of the data. I'm then going to drop out uh, parts of the data, parts of these observations, which are basically days, which don't fit the main uh, signal which the wavelet decomposition identifies. You could call that fairly coarse and ham-fisted, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lose them forever. I might want to analyse why these ones look differently at some point, but for the moment, I just want to get the main overriding signal from these locations, because that's going to be enough probably to deal with just for a moment. And I'm going to let unsupervised, I'm not going to pick winners or anything here, I'm just going to let the wavelet analysis and clustering let me go. If I can't analyse signal and noise, a signal means that over two-thirds of the data fit uh, into this major cluster. All right, if I can't do that, it's kind of 50-50 between signal and noise, I'm going to just keep it all. all right? I'm not going to be too uh, crazy about trying to say, well, there was 53%, which was what I'm going to call signal, and 47%, uh, which was noise, and drop all of that. It's only, I'm going to, if only if I've got an appreciable sort of signal component. And that's, if you do that, and I average off that signal component, I get this sort of trace. OK, so this is London aggregated across 2005, 2009, their internet usage at the margin through one day, aggregating across all days. Uh, that's, in our opinion, a minor achievement just to get, a, get that. And interestingly, if you compare this to this recent uh, data set on mobile phone use data, they actually can split it by family and friends, what they call co-workers and acquaintances, because they know something about the locations that people are calling from. And what we find is that our data looks actually similar, or this is a different city, this is Barcelona, it looks similar to the kind of family and friends. And that makes sense to us, because really what's driving our data, and I'll go to kind of our anatomy of our data, is, as I said before, if, you, if you're at home, generally you've got one IP for your home location. So we're getting pretty personal information about your internet use. Once you go to work or you go offline and do leisure activities that aren't related to the internet, your IP usage goes down. The reason for that is that you stand and you go, behind, go to work, you actually stand behind usually a forward-facing IP and there might be a thousand users using that IP. Probably it's going to be always online because it's a firm. So to this data, you've kind of, at that point, that information's kind of been dropped off. What is generating this signal is probably, we think, we argue, is going to be the kind of personal home use activity of the internet. It also in includes, depending on jurisdictions, mobile phone IP data. Sometimes mobile phones, when they're uh, using data, are going to get an individual IP in some jurisdictions. Sometimes it's one IP and then they channel them through and distribute the data that way. But there's definitely going to be some mobile phone use data in here as well. Again, tying it more to the personal, although obviously some people, uh, mobile phone use is uh, during the workday and so on, but they're going to be using that device at the time. So what we think is going on is we've got a sleep effect where people drop out, uh, their internet usage goes down overnight. Uh, typically in, in London here we've got a minima at 4am. Then there's kind of a workday area. And interestingly, the graph that I showed you with this kind of linear build rate during the day, you can actually think of that as IP online that's missing. There's sort of, if everyone was at home and no one was going to work or no one was doing any other leisure activity, it's just we slept, we woke up, we all went online at a certain time, distributed some way, maybe Gaussian or whatever, we would possibly expect this to hit its kind of symmetric peak at some time during the day and then decline again during the rest of the kind of night time. Actually, those people are missing because either they went to work or did non-IP-related leisure activities. And so we can kind of think about different areas here and start to build perhaps some behavioural models for what exactly is happening to, to drive the sleep time versus the daylight uh, IP trace. This is just one city, by the way, London, OK? Different traces look different. Now I can do some start to do some interesting stuff. What about if I... Because I know the dates of these days, I can split them out by day of the week. So I can actually start to look at London's internet usage at the margin through Monday to Saturday and Sunday. Now let me just put something over that to give you a bit of help. What if I fit a cubic spline to this first day, and I call that, say that's the canonical Monday trace, and I lay that through the rest of the days of the week, what well, you start to see is departure from the Monday trace. And you can start to pick up interesting things like the Friday-Saturday night effect. There's less internet online activity on Friday and Saturday night. Why? We think people are out doing non-IP-related leisure activity. Um, that's probably healthy for London. Maybe there should be more of it earlier in the week, I'm not sure. Um, but you also see things like lion effects. So there's more people on Saturday morning and more people in general on Saturday online than there is on a Monday we because we think people are probably at home doing a little bit more leisure or maybe work on their computers using their home IP addresses during that time. You can also see sort of a creeping uh, Saturday effect starting on a Friday morning as people maybe have a lion and so on. 
there's interesting data which you can start get access to because of these uh, days of the week and so on. Now let me just uh, show you taking this to multi-cities, which is where the real power of this data starts. So we've got some sort of analysis of a single city. What we do is we take Esri's 2011 metropolitan shape file, which allows us to get the lat latitude and longitudes of these IP activities which are located at a city. We're going to get, uh, at the start, there's around 2,400 cities. We're not going to have excellent data for all of them. We're going to drop out ones where there's less than 100 users online in any one of those 15-minute segments. Uh, yes, that's kind of biasing against those who have less computers and so on, but for the moment, we're interested in data quality and getting general signals. We're also eventually going to drop out uh, cities where there's less than about a month of data for the whole year. So we're going to aggregate up for the cities and averaging. If we have less than a month of kind of days, then we think maybe we're may have idiosyncratic effects of the sampling of that city, so we're going to drop it out as well, just as a first pass. That gives us a city IP activity database. Now we can start doing some interesting things with this data. So, for example, and I guess this comes back to Rob's point, how do you deal with all of these cities? Well, you want to have some characteristic which describes a city's internet activity. There's various characteristics you could think about. The trick, as he said, is to get from the very many observations to distilling it down to a few characteristics of importance about those locations, then you can play off the, the characteristics against each other, do clustering and so on. So here's the uh, trough times and the peak times of the IP usage for a whole subsample of cities here. Okay, this is uh, over a thousand cities we're now looking at. If I just plot the trough times, and here are the waveforms, if you like, the intraday waveforms, you can see the trough time is the earliest here and then gets to the latest here, and I colour them and chuck them on a map, what we start to see is some interesting political trends. So Spain, I'm, apologies if you're Spanish, or maybe you know this, it, it appears everyone gets up a little later, uh, the IP trace is later. Now, is that unexpected? Not really. Uh, but we can start to see areas, if you like, have this Spanish uh, behavioural tendency, which you otherwise may not have had uh, access to. You can also see the early rises down probably on the coastal cities in France and England, having a lovely time, uh, getting up early perhaps, and that's their daily life, and so on. And you start to see trends around the world. But that's just the peak and the uh, trough. What if now I try and get at the canonical behavioural integrate patterns of cities around the world? What if I was trying to bin all those cities into certain uh, types? Is there a, like a, a Paris type or a Tokyo type versus a New York or a Spanish a Barcelona type? What I'm going to do now, I could do various takes of doing that. I can use hierarchical analysis. What I'm going to do is use k-means and kind of force it to six clusters. So I get some broad-based uh, types. And these are the six types I'm going to be, uh, that the k-means analysis pulls out for me, OK? Using, again, wavelet decomposition. So I get the coefficients, and I'm going to do clustering on those. Again, this is all pretty data mining activity. Now I've got the types, and now I can look at the behavioural types, which we think are probably well informed by culture, economic conditions, and so on, which I can start now looking at spatially. Again, you can see the difference to Spain versus the rest of Europe. You can see some Spanish-like tendencies in kind of Russia and the Eastern Bloc. Interestingly, if you look at Europe, you can see there's this division, if you like, uh, between the kind of bluey, greeny types, which is the Poland sort of stuff, and then if you go to the right-hand side of the border, you switch into a different phase. So there's these interesting cultural, behavioural aspects that are being revealed through this internet usage activity, which is what we really want to train our attention on. Having a look at uh, Asia and sort of northern Asia, you can see that within three groups of uh, cultures, so South Korea, China and Japan, you've got quite different internet traces coming out, reflecting more than likely prosperity, culture and so on are being uh, drawn out in the way they live. If I look at the world, uh, then again we get similar sort of interesting uh, political differences in South America. Uh, we've got a Mexican effect versus sort of a US effect, uh, and we can start linking up the different places in the world. That's the kind of... This is, this is about where we're at in terms of this. The next thing we really want to do is build generative models of why these different uh, traces look like they do. I say so we want to build a model which actually says, well, why is the behaviour in one location versus this location? Again, draw more of these characteristic statistics out, and then we can link it to city-based data. So there's a Brookings Institute project at the moment building a city database, which we can get economic po population uh, and other data on cities. Cities is kind of in economics a bit of a... Uh, a it's, it's a focus of pretty rap uh, interesting inquiry at the moment because of the tipping point, I guess, in terms of getting most people now living in cities, cities being the place of economic and technological innovation and so on. So we're hitching our wagon, if you like, to cities and trying to train our attention on them. 
Uh, so that's the work ahead. So to sum up, where we're at at the moment is trying to handle this, firstly, successfully handling this massive data set, trying to get it into a workable format uh, in a spatial uh, aggregation at the moment of cities. Uh, we've so far been doing data mining, so fairly unsupervised techniques to try and get a feel for what's out there in the data, but it's already revealing some interesting pieces of information about the different cities. And the next step is to start actually building generative models and so on to try and explain some of this data and then link what we're learning to the uh, economic and behavioural data we have on these cities and start to really tie these together. I guess that's hopefully next year, if uh, this is where I'm at again, this would be where we'd start talking about some of the techniques which have been raised so far in explaining and building models uh, between the uh, IP revealed behaviours and the kind of uh, right-hand side variables which we're collecting on the cities and so on. I'll leave it there. Love to. One, two, this one. Correct. Correct. Uh, not at the yet. Basically, this is our problem basket. Um, <laughs> so despite what I've done in terms of cleaning and so on, uh, the Australian signals are pretty, pretty poor in most cases. You'll see it's eastern coast towns. Uh, which, uh, not to be disrespectful to Adelaide and Perth, uh, po uh, possibly means we're dealing with the larger locations, possibly they're very prosperous, possibly we've got too little um, marginal changes in terms of the online activity. That's possibly one explanation. I'm not really persuaded by that because we've got better information coming out of Tokyo, you know, New York and so on, where you would expect these places are surely going to be the ones where you've got, you know, uh, less to gain out of these marginal changes in uh, IP activity. So basically, you, you, absolutely, uh, these are these in particular, there's very few cities like them. Uh, we, we need to understand better why they look like they do and probably go back and do some understanding. It's something, it's in the to-do list at the moment. It's just unfortunate it's our cities. Steve? Fraction online. So, sorry? Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, so it's a flows versus, yeah. Uh, no, um, we don't have flows information, so this is just online, offline. That said, um, I'll maybe talk to you at lunch about some plans we have to get flow information and combine it here. Uh, there's some other data sources. There's, uh, I've already alluded to it, but basically research on the internet falls under three areas at the moment. Uh, and the one that we're in uh, is kind of uh, academic legal is actually probably the smallest. Uh, there's uh, illegal, uh, which is reasonably large for reasons of commercial gain and uh, downloading uh, content, pornography and so on, and then there's kind of military. Uh, and we're trying to interact with these worlds uh, to get out the data that we need. Oh, sorry, I should say commercial, which is the legal uh, but proprietary protected stuff as well. Yep. Final one, I think. Yep. 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 Um, great question. Uh, for those of you who are uh, into global data uh, and time reference global data, uh, time stamping is really a very annoying part of it. You get information, uh, as one uh, a friend says, satellites work in Earth time, which is UTC, and you have to figure out the rest. Uh, and the real annoyance comes when you think about it. Uh, actually, for political reasons, uh, you might have time zones, but then you've got daylight saving, and these don't necessarily aren't consistent over years. People change these things. So actually what you need is a data set which gives you the actual usage of daylight saving on and offs referenced through history. We have got that, and yes, these are all corrected for that, but it is a real headache, uh, and uh, that was actually quite a bit of the work. To learn anything was actually to put them into the local time. So these are all local time... Sorry? Oh, in Brisbane, no daylight saving. Yeah, tick for Brisbane. But 
<laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, they're corrected for it, but it's a huge headache. Uh, but we've managed to solve that particular one. All right, thanks. <laughs>